3rd, just in a couple weeks. I'm sure you can get tickets at the Welcome Center today, so make sure you do that. It's going to be at 5.30, also right here in this room. There is a uh, New Testament scholar um, by the name of Walter Hansen, who's written a great commentary on the, on the book of Philippians. So if, you, if you're into reading commentaries and looking at all that kind of thing, that is a great one. But um, he points out that Paul's letters have these parallels, have 10 actually parallels that, uh, that are in the ancient world that were letters about friendship. Okay, or even small essays on friendship. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to go through all this stuff and everything that a, that a commentary would tell you. But I'm going to say this. It's important for us to look at different ideas and how people, uh, theologians especially, and people that have, you know, a lot of people have more degrees in Fahrenheit, and they start looking at Scripture and digging deep down further than, than we could ever do on our own. So it's, it's, commentaries are good. But listen, this is always going to be the ultimate authority right here. Okay? So, uh, so I encourage you to read commentaries, but I encourage you not to make commentaries take the place of the Word of God, okay? Don't do that. But Walter Hansen's a great one, and he, he wrote these things about particularly Philippians. And Philippians, this chapter, this, this second part of this chapter in chapter 1 that we're going to look at, and it talks about relationships, it talks about friendships, and, and this portion of Scripture we're going to look at today is actually talking about biblical friendship okay so we're going to look at that kind of thing and we're going to dig a little deep relationships are so important to God because he knows how important relationships should be to us amen relationships are important it's it's scientific it's scientifically proven that if you take someone isolate them for extended periods of time with no contact with any other person they will go insane because they need that relationship with other people they need that friendship. They need that in their lives. Now, like I said, I'm not going to go through all the ten parallels that, that Walter Hansen lays out. But he does conclude that Philippians, along with unity and encouragement, which we looked at, started looking at in the last couple of weeks, is a letter of friendship. The, the, whole, the whole book is a letter talking about friendship. He says it's not merely a friendly letter that fits this pattern, but this is what he says. But Paul transforms the meaning and experience of friendship by redefining each of the essential ideas of friendship. Given these Hellenistic essays on friendship in terms of communion with Christ and empowerment by Christ. In other words, what Paul gives us is a letter about Christian relationships. Okay, It's important to have Christian relationships. It's also important to have relationships outside the church because we, we know people are people and we need people in our lives. So this morning, I want us to consider the implications of this stuff that we're going to talk about, this letter of these teachings uh, for our own relationships with one another in the body of Christ. We have to look at our relationships now. You have to look around a room and say, who do I have a relationship with and who do I not? One of the things that I've, I've told myself this year, uh, actually it started last year, but one of the things I told myself is I want to go to lunch or coffee or something with somebody that I don't know very well this year. Every, every month I want to do that or every week as often as I can, somebody I don't know very well because I want to get to know people. It's not something that's, well, that's your job. No, it's not my job as a pastor. It's my duty as a believer to be in people's lives and to have people speak into my life as well. It's something we should do. So I want to look at these things. I want to begin by just reading the first main paragraph, or at least a portion of the main paragraph in chapter 1. So we've looked at the greeting. We've looked at the first couple of verses. So this morning I want to pick up in Philippians chapter 3, or chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, okay? This is what it says. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, 
because I told I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. A lot going on here. Uh, this morning and next week, I'm going to break down this, okay? Uh, we're going to look at biblical friendship, and I want to look at three things particularly. Number one is I want to look at the nature of biblical friendship. What is the nature of it? What does that look like for us? And the second thing is the building blocks of biblical friendship. There's biblical uh, building blocks that we need to look at and we can dissect in this portion of Scripture that Paul is speaking of. And the third one is the power of biblical friendship. We'll see the difference that makes that, that friendships and, and relationships make in our lives as well as the church and the mission of of the church. I'm going to tell you right now, if we can band together, we are dangerous for the gates of hell. We're, we're dangerous. Like the, the enemy is scared of a unified church. He's terrified of a unified church because when a church is in unity, that means disunity is not on the scene because when disunity is here, he has a, he has a way in. Make sense? It's kind of like any family. If he can get a way in to the, to the family, he can destroy it. And that's why the enemy, he wants to destroy the family unit. Because if he can destroy the family unit, he can destroy the church. Why do you think, and listen, I'm going to props to all you men in here. But why do you think most churches are a very much higher percentage of women attenders than men? Because men are wired different. Right? Women are sensitive, but here's the thing. They're sensitive to the Spirit of God more than men are. Men see church as a more feminine thing to do. Step back. Women don't. And it seems like I was reading this thing not long ago where uh, the, this guy was doing this church strategy thing, and he said men don't attend church as much as women because they see a lot of the things churches do cater and gravitate more towards women than men. And I'm thinking, well, maybe that wouldn't be the case if, if churches would teach that men need to step up and be the man of God that he's called you to be and walk in here and lead your family into the house of God. Maybe that would be, wouldn't be a problem then, right? We have a men's ministry here, by the way. I'm going to encourage you to be a part of that, man. It's great. Michael Reese, if you know Michael Reese, he's kind of leading that thing. They do all kinds of stuff. And um, it's great. It's great for men to be men and step up. Amen? So understanding biblical friendship from Philippians. That is the first thing we're going to look at, okay? Uh, number one is the nature of biblical friendship. That's the thing we first talked about was the nature of it. First off, I'm going to start with some definitions. The nature of biblical friendship. There's a definition there. What are we talking about? And how are we talking about biblical friendship? What is that? How is that different than anything else? There are a number of different words that we use. None of them quite get at the idea of the word that Paul uses in this letter. Okay, when we think about biblical friendship, what do we think about? We go to church together. We think about maybe we go to lunch on a, on a Sunday afternoon after church. We go to lunch together. We do all these kinds of things together. Maybe we're in the same group. But what is Paul talking about? What does he mean by this? The key word is seen in both verse 5 and 7. Okay, so when you read this portion of Scripture that we just read, there is a key word here. That is, that is spoken in this scripture. In verse 5, the word is partnership. If you look at that scripture, can we put that scripture back on the screen for a moment? The, the Philippians chapter, uh, verse 3. It says right here, Because I hold, okay, I thank my God of remembrance for you, my prayer, and then you go down to the next one. Look at the next one. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are partakers with me of grace, okay? So there is this idea here when it says partakers, that is a, the same word for partnership, okay? So partnership and partakers, and it translates into a Greek word. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you the Greek word. 
I'm not a huge guy on going, okay, everything I say, I'm going to throw out a Greek or something definition to make myself sound smart. I'm not going to do that. But I think in this case, we need to understand the context and we need to understand the definition of what Paul is saying here. So in verse 5, the word partnership is similar and it kind of goes with the next word in verse 7 that we just look at, partakers, okay? And the Greek word here is koinonia, okay? Koinonia. Now, this is what we look at when we think about this, because we look at the word koinonia and we say, okay, what is the definition? Now, here's the definition. It translates in a few different ways. It translates fellowship, okay? So when it translates fellowship, what do we think about when we think about fellowship? We think about, well, we get together, we hang out, we do all this kind of thing, and that's fellowship. Fellowship with one another, right? We have a potluck. We have, you know, a small group or a life group, whatever it may be. That's fellowship. So, we, okay, I, I hear you on that. But that is not what Paul has in mind. There is another translation also to this word. It's communion. Another thing we think about when it comes to communion is we think about the little juice and the little cracker that don't taste very good. Right? I know. I know it's like eating styrofoam. I know. But we think about that. When we think about the word communion, we think about, you know, eating again. We, we like to eat. People like to eat. So we hear these words. We go, okay, let's go straight to food. So when we look at that, we hear that. Well, that is the translation in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But in Philippians it means so much more. The word partnership is actually a really good word for it because when you think about partnership, probably carries this idea of a business partnership, a business relationship. In the ancient world, the word koinonia had that implication as well, okay? So Paul was kind of going that direction. But here's what the word literally means. Are you ready for this? A close association that involves mutual interest and sharing. There's no food in there. I don't hear anything about food. But that's what he's talking about. It's an exact definition from the Greek-English lexicon. It is saying it's a close association that involves mutual interest, something that we're in together. So this whole idea of kononia, so when we come together for a prayer and worship night, we are in a state of kononia, according to Paul. What we're doing is we're coming together in fellowship, we're partaking, we're having communion together in the Spirit, and we are making a business transaction with Jesus to say, I want more of you and less of me. And that's what relationship with Jesus is all about. But when we come together as a church, and we do it together as a church, mighty things happen. That's why Paul stresses the idea of biblical friendship. Because it's so important that we understand what it is. Here's what Walter Hansen says again in his commentary, which I think is helpful to understand. He says this, standing behind the English word partnership, the Greek word quinonia connotates a variety of close relationships involving mutual interest and sharing. And then he lists off all these different things. Here's some of the things that's included. Marriage and family, or marriage and relationships. Friendships, business partnerships, common ownership of property, citizenships, religious organizations. These are all things that we can build relationships with. You saw Quinonia take place right here on the stage. When my wife was standing up here holding a baby, and I said, does it make you want another one? And she said, no, and we were in complete agreement. <laughs> it was right there. No. We good? All right. All together. There are notable uses of this word in the New Testament. For example, Acts 2, chapter 42. The new church, the infant church, just began in Jerusalem. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the quinonia, or the fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the, there's that word again, quinonia of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You were called into the fellowship of his Son. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God in the quinonia, the fellowship 
of the Holy Spirit be with you. Here's another example. In, chapter, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, John proclaims what he has seen and heard so that his readers may also have fellowship or quinonia with us. And indeed, he says, our fellowship, our quinonia, our quinonia is the Father, is with the Father and with the Son. These writers seem to envision a kind of relationship that is all-encompassing. A relationship in which Christians are bound together to one another, but they are also bound to God, the Father, and the Son, Jesus Christ. They are in agreement. We as a unified body of Christ, we as a church, are bound together by the salvation that we've received. So if we receive salvation, we're in it together. If I look at you and go, are you saved? And you say yes, and I say me too. It doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter what sins you've committed. It doesn't matter if your sins were greater than my sins. We're all in it together now because we find unity through Jesus Christ. Amen? Are you with me this morning? It's a union and a communion of the saints. Remember, we're saints according to, to, to Paul. Read that first one again. With the Father and the Son through the Spirit, sometimes his word, this word, this Greek word, quinonia, carries the idea of financial partnership. And that's also one of the connotations in the letter to the Philippians. In fact, Paul uses the verbal form of this word in Philippians 4 to talk about the Philippians' gifts to him, their financial gifts to him. They talk about this as well. Paul uses the word in other places to talk about the contributions that were made to the poor in Jerusalem. Romans 15, or the saints in 2 Corinthians. When you put all this together, what it means is that quinonia, or what I'm calling biblical friendship, it involves a self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. That's what it involves. It's the definition D.A. Carson gives. He says this. He says a fellowship or quinonia, this gospel friendship, is a shared commitment to a common mission. It is sacrificial conformity to a shared vision, and that's what we're after. Listen, if we can get on the same page and we can have the same vision going forth, our church will rock a city. It will change lives, but we have to be on the same page. When I talk about kingdom builders, and no, I'm not talking about money today, but when I talk about kingdom builders, I talk about partnering together. I'm talking about getting together in a common place, in a shared mission to reach the world for Jesus. That's what we're talking about. When churches share vision or vision statements or vision ideas, what they're doing is, what the pastor or what the leader or whoever it is talking about it, what they're doing is they're trying to get everybody on the same page so that we can all carry the vision together. Because if one person has to carry a vision, they will die. It will not happen. The vision will die with them. Because it's too much burden for one person to carry. Reach the city of rapid. Reach this community with the gospel. If me or someone else is the only ones carrying it, it will never happen. But if we all get behind it and carry it, watch what God does through us. Because it takes that. It involves friendships with other believers. It's not merely friendship that's based on common affinity. You like the same sport or you like the same TV shows or you like the same books or the same movies or the same music or whatever. Those kinds of friendships are great. Absolutely, that's awesome. But that's not what we have in mind when we're talking about biblical friendships and what Paul is speaking. Instead, we have to look at the building blocks for a distinctly gospel or biblical friendship. So we see number one. Here's number two. The building blocks... So we got the nature of biblical friendship. Then we have the building blocks of gospel friendship. The building blocks. That's the second part of this message, okay? And, and it's really the main part because I want to take you through these building blocks. And we're not going to finish this all today. So people are like, well, no, it's 10 minutes till and he's going to, no, we're not doing that, okay? But I will tell you this. 
There are these things, and they're very important for us as a church to understand when we're dissecting this portion of what Paul is talking about. So building block number one is shared experience. It's shared experience. Look at verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your quinonia, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay, that's the first occurrence taking place in this letter. What does Paul have in mind? Your partnership in the gospel. He almost definitely has in mind their contribution to his ministry. Now, here's the thing about Paul. Paul had several ways to contribute to his ministry. The main one was a prayer covering. He, he asked people to cover him with prayer. Not just cover him with prayer, but intercede for him as he went on these missionary journeys. We're going to be interceding for things tonight. We're going to go after Jesus and ask God to bring healing, to bring power to people's lives tonight. That's what we're going to do. He references this exact same thing in chapter 4. He has in mind the shared partnership, but it's not just that. It's shared partnership in the gospel from the very first day. He's, He's thinking back. To the founding of the church. Remember in in, in Acts 16 is where all of it began for the Philippians. And so if you go back and you read Acts 16 and you think about what he's talking about. He's talking about the partnership between people that were not of the same backgrounds, ethnic groups or anything. Forming a body of work so that they could go and proclaim the gospel. But it's not just that. He's thinking of the relationship that they now have. Because they have come to faith in Christ. Listen to what he says in verse 6. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's not merely their commitment to the mission. That's the work of grace in their lives. He's appealing to that. He's speaking into that. Verse 7, he says, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I told you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This is connected to their partnership with, Christ, with Paul. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Quinonia. He's saying this partnership that we're having together, we're in it together, so you are a part of me as I suffer for Jesus. Isn't that crazy how we can have those kind of relationships with people and we can feel each other's pain sometimes? Somebody's going through a hard time. Why do we have a burden to pray for somebody going through a hard time? Because we feel that. Because why? Because of Koinonia. We're in it together. We're partakers together for the sake of Jesus. And in Christ, we are family. Amen? When you hear their experience, or... Let me go back a little bit. If you ever noticed, if you're a believer, if you ever noticed that any time you hear someone share the story of how they came to saving faith in Christ, there's something about it that resonates in your heart. If I told my testimony right now, there's some, someone in this room, we would, be, we would be connected. We'd be on the same page because you, you would understand what I might have gone through. Or, or if somebody else told their testimony, you would understand what they went through. So there's this connection there. There's this spiritual connection. There's this biblical friendship there. There's this friendship in Christ. When you hear their experience and you listen, we have the same story. We may have come from different paths. We may have come from different backgrounds, but we're saved from different sins. But the story of every Christian is the story of ruin and redemption and regeneration. That's what the story of of believers are. It doesn't matter what your sin was. What matters is what happens to your sin when you accept Jesus. That's all that matters. You read the labels. Have you ever done this before? you ever read the labels attached to products you buy? Have you ever, you really? Some of them are hilarious. You ever read them? On a Sears hair dryer. Remember Sears? The hair dryer, you could get everything from Sears. I think you still can, but it's not as good as it used to be in the 80s. Sears hair dryer. 
Oh, they tear up in a week now, right? <laughs> Do not use while sleeping. <laughs> it could be a problem, right? <laughs> On a blanket from Taiwan, it said this, not to be used as protection from a tornado. <laughs> like, these are real. I'm telling you, real. I'm going somewhere with them, I promise. Because you're like, he just shifted gears, and now he's talking about labels. On the packaging for an iron, right? Do not iron clothes on your body. You ever done that before? I'm going to be late. I'm just a little bit late. I'm working on it. On a bag of Fritos. Ready for this? You could be a winner. It was a contest. No purchase necessary. Details inside. I want you to steal them. Don't buy them. I want you to steal them to get the, to get the winner, to see if you're a winner or not. On a Korean chicken knife, uh, uh, kitchen knife. Warning. Oh, God. You ready? Keep out of children. Not reach. Keep out of children. Don't stab your kids, no matter how much you want to. Don't stab your kids. Night tall, sleep aid. Warning, may cause drowsiness. Sansbury Peanuts. Have ever heard of that brand before, Sansbury Peanuts, Sainsbury? May contain nuts. See, I have a theory. Should I share my theory with you? Too many people in line. Here's my theory. Joey, here's my theory. If we remove all the warning labels, you know where I'm going with that, right? <laughs> I'm not sure we would have to put warning labels on anything if we remove them for just a few months. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. You'll be thinking about it. You're like, oh, yeah, I get it. What makes it funny, though, what makes all these things funny is the obviousness of them, right? It's just obvious. Of course I'm not supposed to use a hair dryer while I'm sleeping. Of course a bag of peanuts is going to contain nuts. You know, uh, uh, no, no kidding, right? Don't use the hair dryer while you're in the shower. Okay, what will happen if I did that? It's obvious. But to be direct, I'd love to put some labels on some Christians, so every time your spouse looked at you, they would say, it would say, be thankful for the way you see Christ in me. Be thankful of the way Christ is in me now, opposed to what it was then. Be thankful. Every time you see your kids, the labels that we want to put on our kids sometimes, we wouldn't see those. But we would see labels on our kids that says, remember, I'm not what I once was, and I'm not what I'm going to become. I'm not a baby anymore. I'm growing up now. Yeah, I'm in a bad stage of life right now as a toddler or as a preteen or whatever. Maybe I'm a headache right now, but I'm not what I am going to be one day, especially if God gets a hold of me because of you, because you helped me with that. That's a hard thing to do. We can look back at that time in our lives when we were in darkness rather than light. We were bound by sin. It may be the sins of hypocrisy and self-righteousness, religiosity, if we were raised in the church. But before we knew Christ, we were looking ourselves and trusting ourselves. It may be the sins of immorality. It may be addictions. It may be all kinds of brokenness in our lives. But we are all saved from our sins. We're saved from ruin. How are we saved? We're saved through the cross of Christ, through redemption. We're redeemed by his blood. If we're redeemed by his blood, we're in it together. Right? We're a church family. We're a body of Christ. We're believers together. We should hurt with one another. When Paul was in prison and he's writing these, and he says, you know what? You're, we're partakers together. He wasn't just saying, you should feel sorry for me because I'm in jail. He's saying, I feel for you as well because we are koinonia. We're 
having communion and fellowship together. That's the Christian story. Redemption is the Christian story. That's what happens in every conversion. Every conversion. Have you ever led someone to Christ? This is what happens. Ruin. We see the ruin in their life. Then they experience this redemption. And then this regeneration. God steps in and starts to work. That's a shared experience. That partnership. Seeing someone bow their head and speak to Jesus and invite Christ in their life and to make that decision to follow him should make us weep because we remember that day. That's what Paul's saying. We should remember that day and have fellowship with that person. If it doesn't make your spirit jump for joy when someone gives their life to Jesus, maybe you should give your life to Jesus. It's the foundation, first building block in this biblical gospel friendship. That's first. The second one, we're going to start looking at next week. We're going to look at hopefully the rest of them next week. But that's the first one. I believe that in these last days, I was, I shared something yesterday. Someone actually, somebody shared it with me. And it, it it, it messed me up. I, I, I sent over to Lindy and we talked about it for a long time. Last night, but thank you for sharing. You know who you are. Thank you for sharing that with me because I looked at it and it's a legit thing. And I'm going to get on a soapbox for just a moment for parents out there. Is that okay? No? If you don't want me to, I won't. Here, Here you go. There's something out there right now that's a Christian Ouija board. Yeah, I'm serious. You can get it on Amazon for 30 bucks. We looked at it. We, we looked at the reviews and we looked at everything. It's, it's a, this is the belief of it. And it, it's heartbreaking. Ages eight and up, by the way. You hold the cross, the little medallion in it. And it's a direct line to Jesus that you can speak to Jesus. One review on there I read, it said this. This game is crazy. I don't like it, I want my money back because all I heard was a raspy old man's voice every time he spoke to me. And I don't think that was Jesus. Duh. The enemy is infiltrating the church, trying to get in the church. If you're in this room right now, I want to warn you, and I know this isn't October, so I shouldn't even talk about it. I want to warn you about those kinds of things. Just because there is a Christian sticker or some kind of cross sticker on it doesn't mean it is from God. And you need to be very careful with this stuff because from the looks of it, it looks very spiritual. It looks very much biblical type stuff. You know, like you see a a pretty cover on it and all this stuff. It's not scary or anything. But then if you scroll down, it says oftentimes, you remember on Amazon, it says often bought together. You know what I'm talking about? It's got this game. And it's got a Ouija board right beside it. Often bought together are these two things. There are too many believers inviting things into their house and into their lives that are ruining your child's mind and heart and soul as small as they are. They are very impressionable and they are receiving this stuff. This made me absolutely nauseous and almost fiery mad when I read about this product because we are allowing this to infiltrate the church and the people of God's life. We have to be very careful. So biblical friendship that Paul is talking about with other believers also goes this way. There's a communion with God that we are called to have that if we don't have it, we might want to check ourselves and try to make that, get this relationship going. Because that communion with God will help us to keep this garbage out of our homes and out of our lives. And we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
We need the conviction of the Holy Spirit in the church again. Somebody asked me not long ago, they were new here, we were talking about the church, asking some questions. And stuff like that. One of the questions was, do you guys do altar calls? Because churches have gotten away from that now. I'm like, no, we will never forsake the altars in this church. So if you ever feel like you want to come to the altar, it's open. It's always open. We'll pray for you. Everything. Tonight, we're going to have altar time. Tonight, we're going to have altar time in this house. But I just want to encourage you. I didn't mean to get on a soapbox this morning on that. But it just disturbed me yesterday. I sent it to Brielle, our kids' pastor. I, I sent it to a few people because I'm like, we have to watch out for this stuff and educate people that this is not okay. This stuff is not okay. So, Lord, this morning, God, as we get ready to go our separate ways this afternoon, Lord, I just pray right now protection over the families in the church, over every family, God. May they be protected Lord, just as the, uh, the, the, the children of God in the Old Testament were protected by the blood of the Lamb, Lord, I pray, Lord, the blood of the Lamb over every person here, over every family, over every child that's in our kids' church today. And God, I pray as we look for uh, deeper relationships with each other and with God, Lord, that we may find that. Help us to find that, Lord. We are partakers. We are partners. In this partnership, God, may we be the church and rise up in a powerful way.